This is Greg Pass with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is June the 1st, 2018, and I am conducting an interview with John Herschel. Am I saying that? Henschel. Henschel. How, how do you spell your last name, sir? H-E-N-S-C-H-E-L. Okay. And we are at uh, World War II weekend in Reading, Pennsylvania. So, John, can you uh, please tell us your full name your, and where you were born? John Samuel Henschel. I was born in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Okay. And what war were you um, involved with? Vietnam. And uh, what branch? I was in the Air Force. And any prior military in your family? My, oh, <laughs> my mom, my dad, all my uncles, my cousins were all in the service. My, my mom and dad were in World War II and all my uncles were in, in that area. And some were in World War II and some a little before and a little after. My cousins went in about the same time I did. And um, what, were, were you drafted or how, how did you enter the military? Service? Well, I, I knew absolutely there was no shadow of a doubt I was going to be drafted. So before I got drafted, I enlisted in the Air Force, just so I had some choice in that. Like I said, all my uncles and my mom and dad were all in the Army. My cousins were all going in the Navy and I wanted to be a little different, so I went in the Air Force. And um, for your military occupational specialty, did you did you have any say in that, or did they just say this is what you're going to do? No, actually, I went. I, they I was put in map compiling first, which I absolutely didn't care for, and they gave us a choice that we could stay in that or get out of it, and it just I honestly didn't care for that. It was looking in. I mean, it's an important thing, but it wasn't what I really wanted to do. So then they said we could get out of it, but then we wouldn't have a choice. And I ended up in security police, which was fine with me. I and I enjoyed that anyway. And I'm sorry, what year did you enlist? 66, 1966, June 66. Okay. 18 days after I graduated from high school. Okay. And then actually, I got my draft notice while I was in basic training. So oh, really? that's how close it was. <laughs> <laughs> so um, okay, so walk us through um, your training that went into security forces and. Um, and, and how you ended up uh, being a dog handler? Well, I went to Lackland Air Force Base for basic training, and then when I got to Loring Air Force Base, Maine, and I realized there was a canine department, it was I, right away I put my hand up. I just wanted to do that. So when I got in the training, we had what, more or less what they would call on-the-job training to get into canine, and I became a canine handler there. And then uh, when I got to, sent to Vietnam, then I got sent to, back to Lackland again for combat training to go to Vietnam after I had been a dog handler. And then when I got to Vietnam, I got right into canine when I was over there. So let's, let's start with uh, duties um, in the United States as a canine handler. What were your duties, uh, I'm sorry, what post were you at at first? Loring, Loring, Loring Air Force Base, Maine, right on the Canadian border. Okay. Uh, that was a B-52 base. So okay. basically we were on, which I loved up in Maine because Maine is just, it was pretty much wilderness and out, right outside of Caribou, Maine. And we had moose and all kind of wildlife out there. We had a big beaver pond that was on one of our posts. So we were out on the perimeter, but we also, before I got into canine, it was basically uh, protecting the B-52 bombers. And once I got into canine, then we were moved out to the perimeters and all around the outside of the base. And that's, I enjoyed that because we were out in the, in on the perimeter. And what kind, what kind of dogs did you learn? German Shepherds. And do you remember the dog's name? Oh, well, all of them. I had, uh, my first dog was Arno. He, his name was Arno von Hoffen. He was a registered German Shepherd, the only registered dog I had. The other dogs were donated dogs that didn't have papers. But then uh, when I went to Vietnam, the first dog I had was Rocky. And unfortunately, he was at the end of his career and he had hip dysplasia pretty bad. So after the first, uh, two months, I think it was, they, they had to put him down. So I got a trip to Tachikawa, Japan, to the big dog training center, which was a training center for Army, Air Force, Marines, and Navy all went there for their dogs. So I got a new dog there named King and took him back to Vietnam for the rest of my turn, tour in Vietnam. And was he a GSD too? Was he a German Shepherd too? Uh, more or less, okay. <laughs> mostly German Shepherd. Uh -huh. And then uh, after I came back to the States, I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, and had another shepherd there. And then we went from security dogs into the patrol dog program, where they were trained for uh, drug detection and, uh, and, and just base patrol and escorts and all of that kind of duty. So it was kind of nice to be in both areas of working with the dogs. So you mentioned the difference between security and like the law enforcement dogs. Explain. Keep in mind, most people that are going to watch this video don't know a lot about how military working dogs work. What is the difference between the security dogs? The security dogs were basically on the perimeter, and, and those dogs are trained to uh, alert and detect and alert, 
and then of course attack it when if you if you let them go and uh, their their main purpose is to detect and alert alert and detect and then with the patrol dogs there, there's just a lot more training that goes into them where you can interact with people and like i said tra train for them for trailing human scent and for drug detection as a matter of fact it, it sounds maybe a little arrogant or, or prideful but i was the first dog handler and dog in the Air Force to be trained for drug detection at the time when I first came back from Vietnam because drugs were just beginning to be a problem then and uh, we actually just focused on marijuana at the time and we'd so we'd uh, take packets of marijuana with a special agent and all of that at the time and to watch where the marijuana was and all of that and we would sew that into packets and since the dogs were trained for trailing human scent, we would put these packets of marijuana in the socks and then run, have the dogs trail the human scent and then work with preys and all of that. And the dog I had really got good at detection where I could let him go in a warehouse and he would go through the whole warehouse where there might be some, uh, part of it would be for mechanics and garage and another part would be a warehouse and another part would be offices and he would go through that whole place just to find a little packet of marijuana. He was excellent. But then he would also be trained to attack right out of the car window and stop halfway and good good work. I enjoyed it. So let's back up a little bit to Vietnam. So when did you find out you were going going to Vietnam? I got well I, I got over to Vietnam in on December eighteenth, nineteen sixty seven, right before the Tet Offensive started, which was January thirtieth, nineteen sixty eight. And uh, so I got there December 67, and then January the Tet Offensive kicked off. What, what were your initial thoughts when you landed? What, what, describe the environment. The very first thing that happened when we landed at Benoit, we were taken off the airplane and escorted immediately to the largest sand pile I've ever seen in my life because uh, uh, one of the Army posts nearby was being attacked at that particular time. And you could see the trace rounds and see the helicopters and all that. Uh, I think it was Long Ben was being hit. And so we were taken right immediately off the plane to a sandbag pile and started filling sandbags. That was my introduction to Vietnam. And, and from that, then I was given a dog and then put to work in the canine department. So um, when you're given the dog, did you get any time at all to, to, to get to know the dog? Or is it like, hey, here's your dog? Well, you, you, stay it, your post it, you know, it, it took a few, uh, I don't remember exactly how long it took with Rocky. Each dog is different. Rocky was, pretty easy to, to break into but you have to you have to form a relationship a bond with that dog because they're they're trained to be aggressive they're trained to attack so you have to do some talking and calming down and getting to know each other but with him it didn't really take that long maybe because he was older maybe because he had had several handler changes in his time or not because I know when I came back to Virginia, the dog they gave me was just horrendous. He had a, he had a bad reputation. He was, it took like three weeks of talking to that dog before I could even begin to take him out. So it, th that all depended on the dog. But ro my first dog in Vietnam was relatively easy to and get. Now his, his name was Rocky, you said? That was Rocky. So tell us about a typical day working with Rocky. Uh, you, you walk in a perimeter, you're a static post, what, what, what's going no, on? No, walking, walking the perimeter, but we had, we were, Canine completely surrounded the perimeter of Benoit Air Force Base, as it did with most of the air bases that we were attached to. And so my post would begin at one end and end at the other end, but there would be a dog handler on each side of the perimeter. So we would cover our particular area. And I, I don't really remember how long that was. It wasn't that big, may, maybe uh, 150 yards, that we would go back and forth on the perimeter until the next person's post started. And so we surrounded the, the perimeter with that. And it, w it was an interesting year, 1968. It was, and like I said, the Tet Offensive kicked off shortly after I got there. And we, uh, we had a major ground attack at Benoit where they just poured right in onto the base. There were over 100 killed Viet Cong and Vietnamese regulars right on the base that came over our posts. And uh, several of our dogs were killed. And you were there for that? Yeah. yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, well, it, it was uh, the rocket and mortar attacks would start first, and then this ground attack started. Fortunately for me, I was on a post that was just far enough away, but in the same sense, while all that was going on, you could see and hear and feel everything that was happening, but you also couldn't leave your post. So I was on post, but 
away from the post where they came across. But one of my friends was really shot up pretty badly and his dog was killed. Our captain was killed and five other guys in what was called Bunker Hill 10. It was a concrete bunker left over from the French there and they just poured right across the base. It, when it was all said and done, like I said, there were about a uh, hundred killed inside the base and there were over 800 killed out, all around the outer perimeter once, once our helicopters and, and our fighter planes and, and the army got involved, then it, it, the Tet Offensive was all over, all over Vietnam, and it was, it was horrendous. I didn't uh, catch the unit you were with. What unit were you with? Third Security Police. And like I said, I was on, on the perimeter. We, we were on the perimeter every night. The whole year I was there, we only had nine days off because we were, you know, getting... As a matter of fact, the year while I was there that year, we were hit uh, like close to 30 times with rocket and mortar attacks. So at this point, how old are you, 19? 19. So what, what's going through a 19-year-old kid's head when you're dealing with all these, all these issues on the perimeter and the attacks, and I mean, what, what are you thinking? That's really an interesting question because you don't really have time to analyze it. You're, it's like you're just there, and we were getting hit all the time. The sirens would go off. We knew the rockets were coming in. You, you'd hit the bunker or hit a little ditch or whatever and kind of wait it out. We, we lost four of our dogs the year I was there. And, and during the ground attack, we lost five of our men, which is still incredible to me. It's one of those things where we had a position w that we were defending, but they were coming in and they had hundreds, hundreds killed all around us. But uh, so in, in that respect, we were very fortunate. And so. so was the Air Force uh, solely responsible for the security or did you have other uh, units? You know, that, w that was one of the things that at the time we were, th we were the security. We did have some Army, uh, uh, Big Red One was there on our post and, and they had a couple positions around behind us. I know one at one point I got fired on one night and thank goodness I had Big Red One, uh, a, a small group right behind us that had a 50 caliber machine gun. So we fired back with our M16s, and that's all we had. We had M16s and 38s and hand grenades and a radio and hand flares, but they had the heavy equipment behind us. And the one night in particular, we had bullets bouncing around us and they opened up and we opened up and that was the end of that. But that we were firing at a distance that time. How, how did the dogs do under fire? Good, they, they, they just kind of uh, hunker down, not, not in fear, they, they knew because there was firing going on a lot. So they would just kind of hunker down in front. That's how actually we lost uh, several of our dogs. When the rocket would go off, the dog would be in front of the handler just laying down. And, and, and I know two cases in particular, the dogs were just torn apart. But, and the, the guys, neither one were hurt because the dog absorbed all of that. And uh, it's a sad thing, but then again, the human life was saved. So, um, I assume you were not married at this point. No, no, no. How did you communicate with your family back home? Letters. And <laughs> to be honest with you, I was a little frustrated with, I, I would send letters home to my mother and my sister a couple, but uh, they, the, all those letters disappeared. My mother was in a transition period and she moved from place to place and those letters disappeared. And when I came home, it was like, well, I, I don't know where they are. So <laughs> that was a, that was a little frustrating because I tried real hard to to document some of the things that were going on. But the, those things are kind of engraved in your mind anyway. And the other thing is now with this period, this is another thing that I really appreciate. Looking back on it, you, you it seems like the further away you get from that kind of situation, the closer you get to it internally. I think. And uh, I, anyway, I got on the internet and I'd start to look up things about Benoit in 1968. And sure enough, I found all kind of statistics that I didn't even know were being taken. Like they, they have historians that are assigned even when, when you're in the middle of the event or in the middle of the war. And I found lists of actually what dates our base was hit. That's why I know that we got hit at least 30 times with rocket and mortar. Not only that, they even had the number of rockets and the number of mortars that would hit the base and th different things like that. They, I have a whole list of the dogs that were actually killed with their serial numbers and, and, and all of that kind of thing. And, and reports written by the uh, base commander about the ground attack and all of those kind of things. So 
that 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 all helped in, in putting all that together after you're back because like you said as a 19 year old kid you're just there doing it and involved in it and and you, you don't realize this even the significance of it so much even when people like my captain was killed and he, he got the Air Force Cross for that and uh, it's it's just interesting to look back and look at it from that perspective of somebody else recording what happened so. um. What, what kind of, um, were you in a tent? Were you in a, in a building? What, we what were your, what were your we had what we called, they were huts. They were, they were buildings. And uh, they were open slats that, because it was hot all the time. And then, they, you know, they had, they had good roofs on them and stuff like that. People used to say that it being in the Air Force and being on a base like that, when the Army units would come in or Marine units would come in, they couldn't get over how good our food was there. But then we'd go out at night and we'd be out on the perimeter and it, it took everybody. Everybody was involved. And so everybody had different situations. But that was another thing about Vietnam. You could come back in at night or in the morning and turn on the TV and you'd see reports of things that happened also. And then you'd go out and see the actual damage. The one night the, the hut right behind us got hit by a rocket and we were told that 16 people were killed in it and, and they ended up being the, the clerical department the priests and the pastors and, and their their aides and that hut was blown up and that was the hut right behind ours and uh, so what was, the, what was the mission of that that um, that air base what kind of aircraft was flying out of fighters that? we had f100 we had a whole unit of f100s and actually I had an I had an f100 crash right on my post one night that, that I'll never ever forget because I was at the end of the runway where they land and come back in and, and this F-100 landed and, and he just taxied right by me and I could see the pilot sitting straight up, just, just like this, straight at, looking straight ahead, not left or right or anything. Uh, but he never stopped at the end of the runway. He just slowly kept taxiing right past me, just a matter of uh, 25 yards from where I was standing, right in front of me. And he just went right on by, not even that far, I don't think. But anyway, he taxied right past me and went right into a ditch and the whole plane blew up right in front of me. and. Uh, it's kind of sad, but when you're in a situation like that, I was the one that first called it in, and a whole bunch of officers came out, and and the one he was a full bird colonel came out, and he was just beside himself. I mean, he was yelling and screaming and telling me to calm down. But at, in reality, which you, was good, but he was the one that was really upset. Evidently, he knew the officer, knew the pilot, and uh, but that was it. And, and then you never get any feedback about who he was or what happened or anything because you went on to the next event the next day and we got hit a lot. So w when you think of your time in country, what, are there any particular events that, that pop into your mind, whether it's uh, frightening experiences, funny experiences, memorable experiences? Some of each. I mean, it, it was frustrating. I mean, we, we lost guys and we lost dogs. but. One of the good things is having that companionship with your dog is you bond. It's, they're like family. I, re I remember definitely when I left, you go around and you, you shake hands with everybody and say, take care, have a good life, be careful, you know, for the people that are staying. And then you go to say goodbye to your dog and the tears just start, even now, I still get choked up about that because the tears start streaming down your face and he stayed. He stayed and then all our dogs ended up, from what we understand, were ended up turned over when we evacuated. The dogs were left there, which is, that that's, to me was just not a good thing. But also the fact of just that you were on, you were tense all the time because you never knew when you were going to get hit. And, uh, but you, you formed some good friendships, but even in that, that was one of the frustrations. And I just talked to a Marine the other night at a softball game that had the same feeling. One of the problems that we faced then was when we went over to Vietnam, I don't care what branch you went, you went over as individuals. You didn't go over as units. Now, I'm, like, it's my understanding now that like with Afghanistan and Iraq, a lot of times people will go over as units. And you're, you already know the people, you've already worked with the people, you know your left hand from your right hand. But when you go over as a bunch of individuals, you have to form those bonds after you're there and you're already in a war zone. And then when you come home, we came over as in, we came home as individuals also, all at different times, depending on what time we got there. And so I, I, 
I don't know. It seems to me like it would have been better to have been more bonded when we were over there. And, uh, and did you say you worked one dog in country with Rocky? I had Rocky, but then he got too old. He had hip dysplasia, and he had to be months. put down by the vet. Yeah. And then what was the new dog? What was the new dog? That was King. King. Okay. And I got him when I went to Tachikawa. Three of us went. The one fellow that was a good friend of mine was shot up really bad during the... Uh, as a matter of fact, we honestly thought he was gone. We thought he was dead because he disappeared and again you're not really told other than he was shipped out he was he was shot and he was hurt pretty bad and uh, nobody ever knew whether he was sent back to the states or what here it turned out he had been sent to japan and he had railroad tracks up and down his back from our own helicopters that had to come in over the post where they poured in because he had been surrounded and his dog was killed but it turned out three months later he ended up coming back to vietnam and then, and then he needed another dog because his dog had been killed. That's what it was. It was almost three months when, I, when Rocky had been put down. So then he went with me and another fellow who had just come into country that didn't have a dog yet that we needed to replace. So three of us went to Tachikawa, Japan, and we got new dogs and we took them back to Vietnam. So and we were there for 14 days. Those dogs were trained by Japanese trainers, interestingly enough. So King was the dog you worked with the most then? In Vietnam, yeah, for the rest of my time over there. Now, did you know the handler that, 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 um, at, that took over as, as um, King's handler when you left? Did you know No, him? no, no, no. No, King didn't have a handler. He, him, uh, King I got in Tachikawa, Japan. He was a first-time dog. He had been trained up there. They have a big dog training school. No, I'm saying when you left country. Oh, no, no. You leave and then somebody else coming in just takes over, but you never even make that transition either. Just, you know, when, when a new dog handler came in, they're taken out to the kennels and I'm on my way home. But... Uh, you got any pictures of him? Oh, I have pictures of all of them. So when we're done, I'm giving my business card. I want you to email. We can put them on our website. I think that would be pretty cool. Oh, I can do that. Have, I can do that. I have pictures of all of my dogs. And I, I really enjoyed my time in the service. And to be honest with you, I was even glad that I was in Vietnam. To have been in the service and been in security police and been a dog handler, I just knew that I should be there. I mean, that, that sounds... I don't know how that sounds, but it, I, I just felt that I should be there. And I'm glad that I was there. I'm also really glad that I came home. My brother was also in there, uh, over there at the same time I was. And that he wouldn't have had to do because of that after World War II, two brothers didn't have to be in a combat zone. But he decided, he kind of felt the same way and he was in the army. But he was in, transpo in uh, uh, transportation and he got sent to Cameron Bay. And fortunately, he was able to come down and visit my, but he got a weekend pass one time, and he was, a, he was given permission to ride around where we posted our dogs, and he actually came out and took a picture of us while we were on post one night. And, but he was at Cameron Bay, which was a great place to be. They had a beach, and they had girls in bikinis and all that kind of stuff. He actually stayed for two tours because it was a good place to be. And here I was in the Air Force, and we were getting battered. <laughs> so your tour is one year? One year, one year. So um, uh, describe your homecoming. It, part, it, it was disappointing in that it was m more my own fault than anything. I didn't face too much of that opposition to the war and all that kind of stuff, just because I didn't get in those kind of situations. I'm kind of a country kind of guy. But anyway, I decided, I since they left me go 10 days early because of Christmas, like I said, I got there December 28th and I came home December 18th, I thought I'd surprise my family. Well, that was a mistake. I left, I left Vietnam in my summer uniform, short sleeves and khaki uniform, and I got home and I, decided, I still decided, well, I'm going to surprise them. I'll just take a taxi home from Philadelphia. I got in the taxi and the meter kept going and the price kept going up and up and up and we got to Norristown and I said, stop here, that's enough. I'm not going to spend any more than that. I got out in front of a, of a car dealership and I went to a phone booth and all the windows were out and it was December and it was freezing. So then finally I got a hold of, I called my mother. She was at work, which I didn't even think of her plan one. So then I called my aunt and my aunt came out to the car dealership and picked me up and they had me stand in the car dealership and wait. <laughs> so that was fun. But I did get home and my sister was in the hospital having her first baby, my nephew, and he was born the day I got home from Vietnam. So it all worked, everything turned out. <laughs> Um, 
in the little bit of downtime you did have when you were in country, what did you guys do to keep yourself occupied and busy? That was another <laughs> disappointment. I, one day, we, we were all allowed to go to Saigon to make one phone call home. That was way before cell phones and all of that kind of stuff. So we, uh, three of us got, somehow we got in, in, in an army helicopter They that went down. You could get a ride to Saigon if you could get a ride. And we got on an army helicopter that was willing to take us down there. And we were on the way down to Saigon and there was a warrant officer on the air, on the helicopter. And his, uh, he had an attache case or whatever that fell out of the helicopter. And we had to land in a rice paddy and retrieve that. So we, we had our M16s with us and all, and we did that. And then we went on to Saigon and we went into the, the USO down there and we made one phone call home, nobody was home. So we went back to Benoit again. Two of the guys did make a phone call, but I tried and didn't. They gave me a, they gave me a slip saying that I attempted to make a phone call and couldn't get through. And that was it. Any USO shows, did you get it? Uh, they had the big Bob Hope show come over, but be, since I was in security police and in K9, we, we had to be we were we worked <laughs> so it it was quite an experience the whole so how long were you uh, ultimately how long did you serve four years four years I just when I came back I spent 17 months in uh, Langley Air Force Base Virginia which was I, I really enjoyed my time down there and I, I ended up as assistant NCOIC non-commissioned officer of the kennels down there in charge of training so and how many dogs did you end up working in your career Five. In, in the Air Force, I had five. Did you have a favorite? Oh, yes. When I came back from Vietnam, I mean, I totally appreciated the dogs in Vietnam because they were your eyes and your ears. But I enjoyed the dog that I had when I came back to Virginia because we went into this patrol dog program with the drugs and the escorts and all that. And the dog I had was just as sharp as a tack. He, he would attack from the window, you know, for training. And we would put on shows and demonstrations and things like that. And that dog was just so good and, and at finding marijuana and, and all of that. So, so what was uh, his name? Slip. His Slip. name was Slip. Yep, Slip. So uh, I, I totally enjoyed the experience. And then after I got out, I ended up working at the State Correctional Institution at Greater Ford as a corrections officer for several years and then I transferred over into being uh, the vocational employment coordinator which means I was basically responsible for assigning all of the inmates their jobs within the prison and then staffing them for outside clearance to work outside of the prison. So I, I kind of used that, that work to stay in that time, type of profession. But So um, you, you touched a little bit on it, you know, politically Vietnam had some some challenges back home, and um, did, did you ever ha run into any issues at all after the after the war was over? Still do, still do, even even within the family. <laughs> I have a sister-in-law that was one of these people that was a huge protester of the war, and and this was, uh, very honestly was just like four years ago. She came down, and it happened to be on Memorial Day. And, and I absolutely am glad we were there and I support why we were there and everything else. And yet some people absolutely feel that we never should have been there. And we were at the cemetery and there was a, uh, um, a retired major speaking about Vietnam and the protesters and this and that. And she still couldn't contain herself. She would vocally groan and moan with almost everything he said. And we had a pretty good argument when we got home from that. And. Uh, Basically, I wasn't real happy with her feelings because I feel so connect I still feel connected to Vietnam and, and, and why we were there. And I think we were there for good purposes. Um, whether, 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 whether there was mishandling or, or being pulled out and all of that, there's all kind of gray areas about whether we should or shouldn't and this and that and the other thing. But the, the, the guys that I served with were, were Glad to be able to serve and glad to come home. And um, so this video here, you're going to get a copy, and we'll also have it on our website. And um, you'll get a copy to send to the Library of Congress if you want to. So theoretically, one of your great, 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 great grandkids might find it, you know, 100 years from now. What, what would you want them to know about your service to your country? That that I was. Excuse me. I get emotional with that. I was glad to be there. I was glad to serve. I was glad we went to Vietnam. 
I don't want to see any com country have to serve under any kind of dictatorship or communism government. I, I want them to have the freedoms that we have. And I feel that that's why we were there. And, and I still feel a little disappointment that South Vietnam fell. And, and so I would want them to know that, that uh, the people that served and gave up their lives gave it up for a good cause. And, and that I was proud to be a part of that. Well, um, I'm going to do something I'm not supposed to do during interviews um, and talk about a little bit of personal story on my, my side. Um, I'm a Desert Storm veteran, and when we came home, it was all you guys, the Vietnam veterans, that lined up to, to thank us. And we've always thought that was because how you guys wanted to be treated and unfortunately weren't. So from a personal standpoint, I, I greatly appreciate your service. And, um, and welcome home. I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I appreciate it. One thing that I, I'm extremely happy with is that there has been a change of attitude in the United States. And I, I kept all of them. I had pictures, like I told you, I have slides, and I made a, I made a really nice scrapbook now of my time over there and all of that, and, and pictures of all the planes and some of the guys and all of that. But. Uh, I kept all that buried for years and years and years just because of the attitude of the country about Vietnam. And then all of a sudden there was a, there was a shift and the school started to open up. Now every year I go to the middle school and we talk, I talk to students from 5th to 8th grade in classroom settings about our experiences. And that has helped the whole healing process so much. It's, it's just it's great. Good. Anything else you want to add? Just that, like I said, every year it seems you get closer to the to the situation rather than further away from it. And and I don't know whether that's because of involvement in the schools or, or just because you, you see a bigger picture than you saw when you were a 19 year old kid. And uh, I'm I'm just thankful for the experience. And I, I again thankful to be home. But I, I think about Captain Maisie every year, who was killed and and. Like I said, he got the Air Force Cross. He was a brave guy. But what I remember about him is coming around and talking to us on post, making the, making the rounds, just saying, how you doing? Are you all right? Do you need a cup of coffee? You, everything OK? And then next thing you know, he was gone. But he was gone fighting for us. That's all. Well, great job. Again, thank you for taking your time to uh, share your, your fascinating story with us. And uh, most of all, thank you for uh, thank you for your service. It's great to meet you. Thank you. Yes, Good sir. job.